We've come to the new Precision Fuel and Hydration Performance Lab, where they help athletes acclimate to the heat and to mild conditions, and we're going to put ourselves through some pain and suffering in the name of science and find out just how much heat does hurt your performance. Because I didn't want to suffer on my own, I found this guy lurking around the Precision Fuel and Hydration HQ, Minty, who says he's never done any heat acclimation. I know, my AC broke in the car for a couple of weeks during the summer, so... I, on the other hand, grew up in South Africa where the summers regularly hit 40 degrees Celsius. I've also been to Kona a few times, including the heat camp leading up to Kona in hot places like Thailand and Mexico and Hawaii and the Philippines. So I've done a fair amount of heat acclimatization. However, I've lived in the UK for the last three years and done pretty much no heat tolerance training. So it's fair to say that Chris and I are on exactly the same footing going into this test, but we're taking bets. You're taking bets on her, who's gonna crack first? Yeah. What are you looking at? What's your, what's your number you're looking at most? The temperature? Uh, yeah. Heart rate? Heart rate. Before I get too tired, let's explain the protocol we're gonna to use today. We've spoken to the experts and they've advised that to really measure the effects of heat and our tolerance of heat, we need to go long enough and hard enough to properly hurt. So, we are going to try and hold our FTPs and see how long we can hold it in the scorching heat of 38 degrees Celsius. Competition's heating up. Uh, we'll be measuring a whole host of variables for comparison, which will hopefully tell us how much heat damages the performance of us highly conditioned elite athletes. While we go, we're gonna measure our core temperature and our power output, of course, our fluid loss, our heart rate, and our heart rate drift. We also did a sweat test before this, measuring how much salt we lose in our sweat. And we'll be permitted to drink whilst we go uh, because we wanna measure the effect of heat and not the effect of dehydration. <sighs> ah. I gotta stop. Stop him. Oh. Ah. Ooh. All right, a little bit of recovery. And then we go crunch the numbers. All right, I've had a chance to recover and uh, cool down a little bit. Took me a while. Uh, I'm now joined by Lindsay Hunt, senior sports scientist here at Precision Fuel and Hydration. We're gonna crunch some of the numbers that Minty and I saw there in our test. Now, I can tell you for free that it was hard. Now, we did a test not too long ago where I held my FTP for a full hour, which was challenging, but I made it. I didn't even get halfway. What was my time that I held it? 26 minutes, 30 seconds. 26 and a half minutes. Not even halfway to the full hour. And Minty, he was- 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 minutes at his FTP. So what else did you notice while we were there? During the session, um, yourself exercised at an average heart rate of 147 beats per minute at 300 mm -hmm. watts. That's 77% of your max. Whereas Minty exercised at the same 100% of his FTP. And he exercised at 170 beats per minute on average. And that was 93% of his max. Don't tell Minty he was working harder than me. It felt like I was working really hard. Like, I got that feeling that you get where you just like, your head starts swimming and you start really, really struggling. I was really hurting. And my heart rate was just going up and up and up. Is that the heart rate drift? And is that because of the heat? Definitely, definitely. As your body temperature rises and your skin temperature rises, your skin blood flow increases dramatically. And so your heart rate has to rise to compensate for that blood flow going to the skin. Definitely noticed that. And what about sweat rates? Sweat so rates were remarkably similar, actually. So Minty lost uh, 1.3 litres and you lost 1.55 litres. And so sweat rates, Minty lost 2.6 litres an hour and you lost 2.54 litres an hour. That's, that's a lot of sweat. I mean, that's unsustainable. Definitely. Like, you can't replace that amount of fluid. So thank goodness it doesn't often get to 38 degrees 
when we're, when we're training. Now, if we did this regularly, obviously for both myself and Minty, this was kind of just jumping in the deep end or the hot end, as the case may be. How quickly would you see that change? In terms of adaptation? It, yeah, adaptation. Yeah. How, how many, how, if we did this regularly? You'd see significant benefits after three to four days in a row of doing this sort of testing. So if we were trying to put into words how much heat slows you down, I less than half, minty a third of what he should be able to sustain. Uh, would you say that that's pretty accurate for most people if they would just went into the heat? I'd say so, but the fitter you are, the better you generally handle the heat. And so if you're someone who's less fit, you'll, you'll have a bigger impact of the heat on your performance. So we see at the lower end of the marathon race times that their race times are um, the biggest, uh, impacted the most from the heat. So there's the secret. You have to get fit to deal with the heat. It's not about acclimatization at all. Is that what you just said? <laughs> not quite. <laughs> okay, that's not true. But heat does slow you down. I hope today in our video we've given you some uh, idea of how much heat slows you down. We didn't even manage half a third of our FTP normal rate that we would in cool conditions. Heat is really a hard burden, but you can acclimatize to it. And with the right heat protocol, you can adapt to it. We have a video on exactly that heat protocol that you can use to prepare for your next hot race coming out on the channel soon. So hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss that video or any of our videos on triathlon training. A special thanks to Precision Fuel and Hydration for hosting us at the Performance Sports Lab. Thanks for watching, goodbye.